watching the ASP Productions on YouTube. Hi, I'm Al Parisi with the Army Air Forces Historical Association. Just wanted to introduce you to Victor. Victor is typically wearing what a gunner on a B-17 or a B-24 would have worn even on a day like today. Although well, it's 86 degrees on the ground and the humidity is uh, particularly high. On a day like today at 30,000 feet, it's about 10 degrees below zero. These aircraft uh, and these crews uh, flew through the, uh, the very worst that the enemy could offer and also the, uh, the elements. Uh, at uh, 10, 20 degrees below zero, it's so cold that if you reach out and touch a piece of metal with your bare hand, your hand freezes to it. And these aircraft are essentially Coca-Cola cans with wings, no armor plating. In an airliner today, you fly across the country, sit back, have a Coke, a cup of coffee, and uh, watch a movie. These uh, aircraft weren't pressurized, and uh, none of the air crew had that kind of, uh, had that kind of uh, uh, endurance or any kind of uh, uh, enjoyment to uh, not have to endure the, uh, the elements. Um, typically, an air crew member was 19 or 20 years old. The missions would last 8 to 10 hours. Uh, anything above 10,000 feet, they would have to go on oxygen. So for about uh, 10 to 8 to 10 hours, you're, in, uh, you're battling the elements, the, uh, the frigid temperatures, and uh, being on oxygen the entire time. Uh, even young men, uh, enduring those kind of uh, uh, stressful uh, uh, missions, uh, those long-lasting missions, um, it would take a, an incredible toll. Even though the crews were 19 or 20 years old, um, they were literally uh, worn and, 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 and drawn after uh, 20, 25 missions. Back in Europe in 1943, you have to remember that um, the attrition rate on a B-17 mission, on a combat mission for B-17s, was 73%. And that meant that for every 12 airplanes that went out on a mission, you only expected three or four to come back. So it took a lot of guts to get into an airplane and realize that that's what God did. For these air crews, uh, what was key was the following. 25 missions, if you survived, flew 25 missions and survived 25 missions, that was your ticket back home. You went back to the States and you trained other crews. But with those kind of odds, you must realize that uh, they knew that their number was up after three or four, perhaps even five missions. They're going to took a lot of guts to keep flying those missions. But um, this is what, uh, what they endured, and uh, this is a tradition that we honor. Uh, with the Army Air Forces Historical Association, we're a nonprofit living history museum, and most of us, all of us, uh, for that part, honor family members uh, or dear friends who served during World War II. And their sacrifices are the same as what's taking place overseas in Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq. Um, and the, the wars will always take place, but we must always remember the young men and young women today that uh, that fight for. Uh, um, our safety, our freedom, uh, and uh, we must never forget their legacy. Victor's typically wearing multiple layers of um, heavy flying gear. Because it's so cold, multiple layers of clothing kept you, uh, kept you um, alive, not necessarily comfortable. Uh, this is a flying helmet, and uh, in terms of a helmet, it's nothing more than a, than a sheet of leather covering uh, this man's head. You'll see he's on oxygen. This is an oxygen mask, a rubber oxygen mask. Anything over 10,000 feet, the crews would go on oxygen, and uh, there was a main system for the uh, the oxygen within the aircraft. Now, the co-pilot on a B-17, for example, everybody thinks that uh, his primary responsibility was to help fly the aircraft. On a combat mission, his prime responsibility once they became, uh, got over enemy territory, was to contact everybody in the crew every 15 minutes and make sure that they responded. If they didn't respond, chances were that their oxygen mask had frozen over because of the uh, moisture in, uh, in their breath and that they had passed out and become unconscious. Remember, three minutes without oxygen and you pass out. Uh, uh, about a minute and a half without oxygen, you pass out three minutes, you're, you're, you're dead. And uh, that was the co-pilot's job, to make sure that everybody on the, on the crew was still safe. Now, with all this heavy flying gear, if you look at a B-17, it's not like it is in the movies. 
aircraft. The aircraft were particularly, particularly cramped. Um, there's really not too much room to move around in the airplane. It's so cramped in the aircraft that you couldn't wear a full parachute as a crew member on a B-17, especially in the tail gun position or the ball turret position that protected the belly of the aircraft. Victor, for example, here would have been a waist gunner, but again, there's no room to move back and forth with a full parachute. The crew members had a complete harness on the aircraft, a parachute harness, and next to each crew station, there was an emergency parachute. If the plane was hit and it started to burn, or if the pilot uh, signaled uh, a bell ringing three times, that was your cue to put on your emergency parachute and jump out of the aircraft. To grab the chute, put it onto your harness, and get ready to bail out took about 25 seconds. When a plane was hit and went into a spiral, you didn't have 25 seconds. Now here's the other drawback to this. If you weighed 130 pounds, you're wearing, say, 45 pounds of flying gear on top of that. These were the emergency chutes that the paratroopers would have. They're reserve chutes. Uh, and it's a 24-foot chute. This ensured that you got down on the ground alive, not necessarily in one piece. With all this weight and a 24-foot chute, you came down fast and you came down hard. You were guaranteed to crack an ankle, at, at the very least. You have to remember, these kids weren't trained on, on jumping out of airplanes with a parachute. They were simply told, here's your parachute, attach it to the harness. If the plane's hit, jump out, hold the, the red handle, and good luck. Of course, the standard line was, well, what, what, what happens if the parachute doesn't work? And the reply would always be, well, bring it back and we'll give you a new one. But uh, again, state-of-the-art aviation in 1943. This was the, uh, the best uh, that, uh, that uh, we had to offer. It was better than uh, what the enemy had. And there were certain tra uh, traditional Air Corps um, uh, items that, uh, that carried a, a special legacy. If you'll notice, this particular gunner has a silk scarf. That's a tradition that dates back to World War I. If you remember the Red Baron with a silk scarf, or World War I pilots wearing a silk scarf that, that fluttered in the, in the wind. There was a practical responsibility to it, a practical application. If you're a fighter pilot or a gunner on a B-17 or a bomber, you're spending eight to ten hours looking about the sky, up, down, sideways, across the way, and after a while, the heavy uniforms, which were made out of wool, would chafe your neck. And after a number of hours, it would chafe and then start to blister. The silk, the silk would protect your neck from the heavy uniforms and the constant motion. On top of that, it looked cool. Can you show what's on the side? Right over here? This is here, for example? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> oh, again, above 10,000 feet, the crews had to go on oxygen and there was a main oxygen system within the aircraft. If for some reason you had to um, detach yourself from the main system, you hooked into an emergency bottle, which was this. This was good for about 20 minutes so that you could walk around from one end of the airplane to another uh, at altitude and not pass out from, uh, from lack, of, uh, lack of oxygen. Anything uh, he's wearing behind him? No. No? Okay. And it's all mostly one jumpsuit. Uh, it's a, uh, this particular set is a B3 jacket. The pants are uh, separate and the, uh, the boots uh, are separate and inside of the, uh, the flight suit you would have worn something called a blue bunny. And that's this particular flight suit here. This is a complete flight suit. And if you notice, it has electrical wires running through it. Essentially, this is nothing more than an electric blanket built as a flight suit. And uh, in a perfect world, this worked uh, exceedingly well. You plugged it in, you turned it on, it kept you toasty warm. But here's the problem. Let's say on a day like today, it's 86 degrees. Let's say there are 36 airplanes leaving this particular airfield over the span of an hour. Now you're sitting in a B-17, which is essentially a Coke can with wings. The sun is beating down on it. You've been sitting there for an hour. You start to sweat profusely. Well, all of a sudden your flight suit becomes a sponge. And by the time you get to altitude and it starts to freeze, you turn the suit on. If there are any breaks in the electrical line, because now this is a sponge and not a flight suit, if there are any breaks in the electrical line, this suit would short circuit. It was possible to freeze and fry at the same time. 
many uh, many stories we've heard from, uh, from World War II uh, uh, gunners about the, uh, the suits malfunctioning and, uh, and them uh, receiving burns from the from the suit, but being so busy and fighting and or fighting off enemy fighters, um, they couldn't um, they couldn't. Uh, uh, their priority was on, on defending themselves and not having to worry about them being burned. Uh, burning, uh, uh, being burned was an afterthought, essentially. Now, what are these uh, masks here? These are all different types of uh, oxygen masks that, uh, that would have been used uh, by uh, combat flyers. Um, different versions of the mask. This was an early version. Uh, this is the um, uh, uh, this uh, flying helmet goggle and uh, oxygen mask rig was used by the Royal Air Force around uh, the time of the Battle of Britain. A lot of American air crews preferred these because the receivers, the earphone receivers, and the oxygen mask were better fit and they were more comfortable than the uh, than the American issue. Oftentimes, a bottle of uh, scotch and a couple of curtains of cigarettes were traded for uh, to get your hands on one of these by uh, American air crews. And what's this over here? This, this is a flak vest. And I'll leave you with this final story. Um, everybody's familiar with the uh, police bulletproof vest, about two or three pounds of mylar. Well, this is the American version developed in 1943. And this alone is 42 pounds. This is a steel belted flak vest. And again, 43 pounds. The accompanying pieces were another uh, 32 pounds. And these are steel belted. These would not stop a bullet. Okay, these were designed to stop any kind of flak or shrapnel exploding around the aircraft and coming through the aircraft. I'll leave you with a story. One day, I'm at an air show. I think it might have even been here a couple of years ago. Uh, I was discussing the flak vest and its history and its components and how it compared to a police bulletproof vest. And we were about four or five deep here, and behind us was a World War II veteran who was nodding his head um, knowingly. So I looked at him, and our eyes met, and I called him forth, and I said, uh, looks like you can tell me about this. Um, are you familiar with it? And he goes, indeed I am. And he goes, see this? See this vest? This type of vest saved my life. I said, well, well tell me about it. And he goes, well, I was uh, 19 years old, flying in a B-17, and uh, one second I'm shooting at a German fighter, and the next second there's a, an explosion, a red flash, and I get hit in the chest and knocked backwards. The time I woke up, you know, he said to me, uh, the flak vest over my chest was uh, tattered and charred and smoldering, and lying at my feet was uh, a burning piece of metal, a piece of metal that had hit me square in the chest and was stopped by the flak vest. And with that, with that uh, note, he said to me, uh, the piece of flak that hit me in the chest had my number on it. I said, well, I, I, can, I can see that. He goes, no, son, you don't understand. With that, he reached into his pocket and pulled out a, an old, worn leather wallet. And he opened it up and took out this worn, battered, blackened piece of steel, which had been the flak piece that had hit him in the chest 60 odd years ago. And the very end of the flak, shell, the fragment, was a serial number. And he said, it has my number on it. I said, I can, I can see that. He goes, no, son, you still don't understand. With that, he reached into his other pocket, pulled out his dog tags. And the last four numbers of his dog tags corresponded to the fragment of the serial number that was on, his flank, uh, on the flat uh, piece. We looked at each other, and we laughed, and he said, because I should have that kind of lo uh, luck with the lottery. But then he got serious. He got very, very somber. And he said, uh, no, seriously, though, because I should have died that day. And here I am standing 62, 63 years later. I, I have five children, 12 grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. And uh, to me, each day, each day has been a gift. It's nice. I might be on the street too, my boss is caught up in that thing. I don't know if you can